You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston and West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go, it's a long way to Tipperary, to the sweetest girl I know, goodbye Piccadilly. Hello everyone and welcome to the History of the Great War episode 168. Last episode we discussed the end of the German offensives and the beginning of the Allied counterattacks beginning with the Second Battle of the Marne. This episode those attacks continue, this time with the Battle of Amiens. At Amiens on August 8th, troops from nearly all Allied countries and the British Commonwealth would participate. British, French, Australians, Canadians, Americans would all take part in an attack to the west of Amiens along the River Somme. The results would be staggering, a success on a scale unexpected even by General Haig, who was known for his optimism about attacks. The result of Amiens would be the first true breakthrough for the Allies for, well, pretty much the entire war. Five German divisions would be shattered, and the advance would continue for almost 10 miles on the first day alone. Ludendorff would call this day, quite famously, the Black Day of the History of the German Army in the War. This episode will cover the preparations that led up to the beginning of the attack on August 8th, and then the day itself. The next episode, we will continue the story of the attack until the focus of Allied efforts shifted elsewhere on the front. The planning for Amiens would begin on July 24th, when Patan, Haig, and Pershing would once again meet with Foch. Foch would state that, quote, the moment has come to abandon the general defensive attitude opposed upon us until now by our numerical inferiority and to pass to the offensive. The decision to pass to the offensive would result in two different attacks. The first was at Amiens, and the second was at St. Mihail on the American sector of the front. In both cases, the goal was to secure rail lines that could be used to facilitate later efforts. Amiens had been an important objective of the earlier German attacks, mostly due to how important the rail lines in and out of the city were to the British. They had not reached the city, but they had been able to sever some rail lines that led to the east and the south, and the attack on August 8th sought to regain some of this lost territory. It is once again worth noting that this attack was not supposed to win the war. Late summer 1918 was still at a point where everyone expected the war to continue into 1919, so this is all just set up for actions that might take place months later. The main planning and execution for the attack was in the hands of General Rawlinson. Haig made it clear to Rawlinson that this attack was to be the primary effort on the British area of the front during the late summer months. There would be preparations made in other areas, but these were solely for the purpose of deception and trying to keep the true intentions of the British away from the Germans. Rawlinson was probably the most experienced British commander when it came to large offensives. He had been involved with many throughout the course of the war, including the Battle of the Somme. To begin the process of launching the attack, Rawlinson would get together with the commander of the Australian Corps, General Birdwood, and his staff. Upon analysis of the situation, the prospects for an attack seemed quite good. The defenses in this area of the front were quite weak, and there were very few German reserves in the area. The British also had very good observation of the German positions, which would give their artillery even a greater advantage. Finally, the ground was very well suited for tank action, which by this point was an integral part of the British offensive plan. Rawlinson's chief of staff, Major General Montgomery, would describe the geography of the area like this. Quote, the country was open and undulating. The hard soil with chalk very near the surface rendered it perfectly favorable for tanks and cavalry. The chances of a successful employment of these arms were further increased by the absence of shell craters and by dry weather of the preceding months. End quote. 
There was one big change that Rawlinson believed necessary for the attack to succeed. In the initial planning for the effort, there was only supposed to be an attack on the south side of the River Somme, but Rawlinson and his staff felt that the high ground on the north side of the river would allow the Germans to direct artillery fire down on the troops to the south. This meant that troops would also have to be allocated for an attack on the northern side of the Somme. There would be a good number of troops available, with the British 4th Army being joined by the Australian and Canadian Corps, and then also being joined by the French 1st Army, under the command of General Debenay. Haig had requested that Debenay and his troops coordinate closely with Rawlinson for the attack, and Foch was happy to oblige. The primary goal for this attack was an advance of about three and a half miles. This would put the Allies back in their former front lines to the east of Amiens that they had occupied before the Germans had retreated to the Hindenburg Line, and then which the Germans had reoccupied during the spring offensives. There were several intermediate objectives outlined for the attack, and they would play an important role in keeping the attack rolling, which we will discuss later. The most important of these was the Green Line, which was halfway between where the attack started and the Red Line, where it was designated to end. The French would be attacking towards Moral, uh, on the right flank, to guard against German counterattacks. Overall, this meant that the attack would occur on a front of about 9 miles, or 14 kilometers. While the Battle of Amiens is often thought of as a British attack, the French would play a critical role. The first real meeting on the topic would take place between Debenay and Rawlinson on July 28th. Five days earlier, the French had launched an attack a few miles south of Moral, and this attack had advanced two and a half kilometers in just a few hours. The goal had been to secure better positioning for the French artillery, and then also just to check the German defenses and morale, which were found wanting. Such a quick success put the French in a pretty good position for the attack in early August. During that meeting on July 28th, the two commanders were able to agree on their areas of responsibility and many other details of the coming offensive. Cooperation seemed to be going very well, even though Rawlinson never really wanted to work with the French. This was due to a variety of reasons, which I won't go into now, because it doesn't matter. Haig was adamant that the British had to attack with the French due to the lack of British reserves, and so whether or not he liked it, Rawlinson had to work closely with Debenay, and they would do quite well. While many things were agreed upon by July 28th, a wrench would be thrown into the plan just a day later. On that date, Foch would write to Haig and say that while the French were doing quite well with their attacks in the south along the Marne, they were running out of steam. It was therefore critical that the British not give the Germans time to properly regroup, and that meant that Haig needed to move up the Amiens operation if at all possible. At the time, it was scheduled for August 10th, but Foch wanted it moved forward at least a few days. August 10th had originally been chosen uh, by Rawlinson because he believed that it was the soonest that the troops could be ready, but on July 29th he met with his commanders to determine if the date could be moved up to August 8th. After this discussion, the move forward seemed possible, and so it became the new date for the offensive. An interesting part of the preparations for this attack was the emphasis placed on maintaining secrecy. Secrecy was considered so important that Foch decided that neither the British or French governments or their war ministries should be told of the coming attack until the last possible moment. This was a huge change from attacks in previous years, where they were often openly discussed by civilians behind the front. Nobody knew about this thing. On August 3rd, Foch made one final change to what he wanted from the Amiens attack, and I will let Charles Messenger explain with an excerpt from his excellent The Day We Won the War, Turning Point at Amiens, 8th August 1918. Charles would say, quote, 3 August. There was another high-level conference between Foch and Haig. The French counterattacks on the Marne were continuing to drive back the Germans, who had now withdrawn to the east bank of the Vess. Foch was certain that they were disintegrating and wanted to take advantage of this. He was concerned that the plan as it stood laid too much emphasis on consolidating the old Amiens outer defensive line at the expense of exploiting initial success. He also said that, it was, that he was considering involving the French Third Army to the south of Debenay as well. Haig assured him that the advance would continue as soon as the reserves had been brought up. Two days later, Haig saw Rawlinson, Debenay, and Cavanaugh, and impressed on them Foch's wish that exploitation should be more positive. End quote. 
So basically, Foch is sort of falling into the trap that every general had up to this point in the war, and he just wanted the offensive to keep going forward. Remember, this is what got the Battle of the Somme in 1916 in such a bad place, Haig constantly wanting the objectives to be further. Fortunately for all of the troops involved, or at least on the Allied side, uh, they would be able to do what Foch wanted this time, and it wouldn't be a giant failure. The front upon which the attack would fall was held by the German 2nd Army under the command of General Marwitz. These troops had been heavily engaged in multiple actions over the course of the year, which had reduced their numbers, and this lack of manpower reduced not just the number of defenders in the trenches, but almost more crucially, it reduced the number of men available to work on those defenses. This problem was really just one of man-hours. There were only so many sets of hands and so many days in which to improve the defenses that they were now occupying, and neither of those were available in enough quantity. This meant that their defenses would be quite weak, which was problematic, since this one German army was about to be attacked by 12 French and 19 British divisions. The Germans would also have very little warning of the attack, due to the lengths that the Allies went to to try and keep preparations secret, including not moving any troops to the front until August 7th. Nine of the divisions that the British 4th Army were Canadian or Australian, with four Canadian and five Australian divisions joining in the attack. These divisions would be a critical part of the Amiens operation, because both corps were made up of some of the best troops available to the British Army at this point. There was also a certain political dimension. In 1917, Lloyd George has set up the Imperial War Cabinet, with the goal of making sure that the territories of the Empire around the globe were invested in the war. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa all had a place in this group in London. And the troops from around the globe were also moved into their own corps or armies or units and made almost semi-independent, again as a way to make sure that the Empire was involved in the war. In this case, the Australian and New Zealand Corps were then given a key role in this first large British attack of 1918. While the British were aware that these were some of their best troops, the Germans knew this as well, and so deception was critical to making the Germans think that the Canadians and Australians were literally anywhere but Amiens. For the Canadians, this meant a pretty intricate set of deceptive maneuvers. Fake orders were created to make it look like they were in Flanders. Headquarters were re relocated to the area. Well, fake headquarters were anyway. There were even casualty clearing stations and other medical facilities, which always accompanied a large attack set up behind the front in Flanders. A few reserve battalions were also sent north, just to add a nice cherry on top of the deception. All of this was just to preserve as much surprise as possible. Now here's uh, what I think a cool little story from Thomas Dennison, a story of the 42nd Canadian Battalion, who talks a bit about what it was like during the last day before the attack at Amiens. Quote, All day long we rested in this pleasant spot. We even had permission to make a little fire here and there under a thickly branched tree and do a bit of cooking. The regular meals are good and plentiful, of course, but we never miss a chance at eating unlimited quantities of extra food. The last tin of baked beans was open. There's no reason to go into battle with a haversack heavier than is absolutely necessary. We washed and shaved carefully in order to look our best before Fritz. Our equipment was inspected for the last time. Gas masks, rifles, ammunition, shaving kit, iron rations, everything was okay. Some of us were presented with an extra gift. Mine was a big and heavy bag containing a dozen or so Mills bombs. Just before sunset, we had to fall in for a final parade, then supper, and at 10 p.m. we were again fighting our way through the throng on the Amiens to Ra Road. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. 
chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons. Any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com slash GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Another important piece of the upcoming attack would be the tanks. There would be over 500 British tanks involved with the attack, with 70 French joining in as well. Most of the British tanks were of the Mark V variety, the newest and best tank available to the army, and there was also a large number of Whippet tanks, which was the British version of the medium tank. A new and intriguing usage of the tanks was shown in the new supply tanks. These tanks were an attempt to solve one of the biggest problems experienced during earlier offensives. How could the attacks get supplies and ammunition forward after the attack had begun? To try and solve this, the tanks would have their weapons removed, and instead they would carry a vast array of supplies. Everything that the troops would need after moving forward were in these tanks. Rifle ammunition, stokes, mortars, grenades, water, shovels, picks, barbed wire, pickets for that wire, sandbags, rations, along with countless other items. This ability to move large quantities of supplies forward was critical to making sure that the troops that got forward could stay there and they would not be caught as so many previous attacks had been by counterattacks at a point where the attackers were low on ammunition and water and they couldn't get anything else forward. The final piece of preparations, as always, was the artillery. The artillery fire at Amiens was a great example of how the British artillery had improved over the course of the war. At Amiens, all of the improvements made over four years of conflict would come into play. The ability of the artillery to fire off the map being high on the list, even the ability of the British map makers to make maps accurate enough to fire from, represented a huge improvement. There was also weather information sent to the artillery every four hours to make sure they were as informed as possible about the situation. All of this meant that the British artillery were in a very different world than they had been in during earlier offensives. The plan was also better now. The artillery would begin firing about 200 yards ahead of the infantry, and then they would increase their range every 100 yards every three minutes. After the 11th lift, they would decrease their speed to a lift every four minutes to make sure that the infantry could keep up. This was the complete opposite of attacks in 1916 and 1917, where the British creeping barrage had increased speed as it advanced, instead of decreasing like it would at Amiens. To accomplish this task, there were giant piles of ammunition provided to each gun, with every 18-pounder having 600 rounds, every 4.5-inch howitzer having 500. When the bombardment started before 4.20 a.m. on the 8th, the power of the guns was impressive. It probably would have been even very effective against the best German defenses, but that is not what they were hitting. Instead, it was falling on weak defenses that the Germans had scratched together over their previous months with limited manpower and materials. The German artillery was also hard hit, with two-thirds of the British heavy guns dedicated to firing on the German artillery. The British estimated that there were 500 German guns behind the front, and they would be heavily outnumbered even before the British started to fire on them, and apparently knocked most of them out. When the British and French guns all began firing, the display was impressive. Here is Gunner James Armitage of the 8th Australian Field Artillery Brigade to give his experience. Quote, on either side of us, as far as you could see, was a great wall of field guns. What the papers would describe later as a wall of guns wheel to wheel along the entire front, Actually, the guns were 20 at 20 yard intervals, but that was close enough. All the guns were still in action, and the sight of all this massed artillery right out in the open without a spot of cover was a sight to see. 
One huge change from previous British attacks was the fact that there would be no large pre-attack bombardment. Instead, there would only be a quick counter-battery fire right before the attack, and then the artillery would immediately switch to the creeping barrage. This all tied in to the incredible search for secrecy for this attack, because now the Germans would not have the warning of a bombardment that would last days or weeks. There would just be none of that. Suddenly, boom, the attack would be going. And that attack would begin precisely at 4.20 a.m. on August 8th. Along most of the front, they achieved an incredible amount of surprise, all things considered. The Allied attack would also be benefited by a heavy mist, which was intensified by the liberal use of smoke shells. The British were still using the Cambrai model for artillery bombardment, with a good portion of the artillery fire in the run-up to the attack being devoted to providing a smoke screen. The infantry would also be accompanied by tanks, which provided close fire support. These tanks were even more valuable due to the power of the artillery, which meant that most of the German opposition came only from scattered German machine gun positions, which some of which were well fortified. The tanks were important in these situations because the Mark V tank was armored enough to be basically impervious to German machine guns, which made them very valuable fire support vehicles when, you know, attacking a machine gun. The Australian commander, General Monash, would describe the last few minutes before the attack like this. Quote, in the black darkness, a hundred thousand infantry deployed along twelve miles of front was standing grimly, silently, expectantly, in readiness to advance. Or are, or are already crawling forward to get within eighty yards of the line on which the barrage will fall. All feel to make sure that their bayonets are firmly locked, or to set their steel helmets firmly on their heads. Company and platoon commanders, their whistles ready at hand, are nervously glancing at their luminous watches, waiting for minute after minute to go by, and giving a last look over their commands, ensuring that their runners are by their sides, their observers are alert, and that the officers detailed to control direction, that their compasses are set and ready." End quote. Now, while Monash's viewpoint is valuable, he was far away from the front lines, but there were many other officers that were much closer to the fighting, and they would have their own viewpoints on the situation. Now, here is 2nd Lieutenant Percy Smith, who would be in the 24th Australian Battalion. Quote, the atmosphere seems tensely charged with excitement tonight. Everyone is keenly interested about tomorrow's great battle and wondering how the tide will go. Optimism is running high at a high pitch. This is the first time the Australians will have been given a fair, open go with unlimited objectives. Usually they have been limited to an advance of a mile or two at the most, and the prisoners and booty captured were not worth the sacrifice of life entailed. Thank heaven the days of close warfare have gone. Such slaughterhouse battles are a thing of the past. Another officer would write about the final minutes before the attack by saying, quote, At ten minutes past four, company commanders quietly passed the order stand to, and presently an equally quieted runner, looming up silently out of the mist, would report his platoon all present and correct. Finally, the tanks had crept forward to their allotted positions in front of the waiting infantry. 419, wrestlet watches previously synchronized were raised to eye level, while the second hands ticked out the last fateful minute. 20 seconds to go. 10, 5, 0. When the first troops went forward, they were covered in a thick mist, which was quite helpful. The Canadians and Australians were in the lead, caught the Germans completely by surprise, with some German units not even really being able to react to what was happening. Lieutenant Albers of the 43rd Reserve Division would be in the line, and his unit would soon find itself overrun. Quote, Unfortunately, our hand grenades had all been used. There was no longer time to operate the machine gun amidst the chaos. Every man fired and defended himself as well as he could. But a new wave of English arrived in force, firing pistols and throwing hand grenades and killing or wounding many of my colleagues. Completely surrounded, shot at, and bombed from all sides, with resistance no longer possible, the 20 men remaining for my company had to surrender. The first set of objectives on the British area of the front would fall quickly, and behind those positions were some of the attackers found a welcome sight, as one man would later recount. 
quote, except for the front line itself, the Hun seemed to have made very little in the way of organized defensive positions. Beyond machine gun posts relying more on the ground itself, ridges were strongly held, but on our approach were surrendered, and the enemy either running away or themselves surrendering. The British did not experience very much early resistance, and the situation was very similar on the French end of the front. Other than some machine gun fire, they mostly just moved forward over empty terrain. They had started an hour later than the British, but for basically an entire hour they marched forward unopposed. Then they halted to allow their artillery to reposition, which took again about another hour, and then the troops began to push forward again. During this time, the British troops also reached their first objectives, the Green Line. Everything was going according to plan, except for the fact that the tanks were still having some issues surviving on the battlefield. As an example, one Canadian division started the day with 34 tanks in support, but by the time they reached their final objectives, only six were still operational due to a combination of reliability problems and German actions. Even though many would not be running by the end of the day, they did at least serve their purpose of getting the troops past the strongest of the German defenses. For the advance beyond the first set of objectives, the Green Line, the British had set up their troops so that the first two divisions in each corps would take the first objective, and then they would be followed by two more divisions that would then continue the advance forward. This meant that from 8 to 8.30 all along the front, the divisions that had been pushing forward in the second wave began passing through those in front. For the Canadians and Australians, this allowed their next efforts to begin uh, right around 8.30 a.m. Jimmy Downing was one of the soldiers in the units that continued forward. He would say, quote, Thereafter, it was fairly plain sailing. Whenever we found ourselves in trouble, we signaled to the tanks, and they turned towards the obstacle. Then, punk crash, punk crash, as their little toy guns spoke and their little pointed shells flew, another German post was blown to pieces. Punk crash. A brick wall was tottered and crumbled amid a cloud of red dust. We passed the place. The machine gun and its crew were crushed and dead. By noon, it was clear that the British attack had been a huge success. The troops had almost universally met their objectives for the day. The Australians had advanced nine miles and the Canadians four. They had also overrun many regimental headquarters and they had taken thousands of prisoners, which did nothing to help with German morale. Bertrand Howard Cox was a British artilleryman who would see the aftermath of those Germans who had surrendered and that were now coming back from the front. Quote, the thing that struck me as being most funny was the way the prisoners would dangle right along by themselves, no escort, to the prison cage about a mile away. If there were 30 or 40 together, they would have an escort, but they mostly passed in twos or threes, all alone. Earlier in the war, there had been many attacks where the Allies had been successful early in the first day, only to then be pushed back by German counterattacks, but that did not happen here. Instead, over the course of the afternoon, the Allies consolidated their morning gains, and they began to consider what their next steps would be. The official German history would discuss the situation for the German troops at the end of the first day like this. Quote, As the sun set on the battlefield of the Second Army on the evening of August 8th, the greatest defeat which the German army had suffered since the beginning of the war was an accomplished fact. The line-holding divisions between the Avra and the Somme, which had been struck by the enemy attack, were almost completely annihilated. The troops in the front line north of the Somme had also suffered seriously, as had their reserve divisions thrown into the battle during the course of the day. End quote. To put it bluntly, it had been a disaster, and things were only going to get worse. Back at German headquarters, there were growing suggestions that the Germans should begin a wholesale retreat to shorten their lines. There was also continual reports of German troops refusing to follow orders, or even no longer attempting to stand and fight at all. This was not and never would be the majority opinion among German troops. Right until the end, most would defend their positions very strongly, but there were enough that it was clearly showing that the German army was in trouble. August 8th had truly been the black day for the German army, but this attack was not over. I hope you will join me next episode as the Amiens attack continues. <laughs>